on the basis of sophisticated models in code that appear not to work in practice. Might it not be possible to look at simpler models like earnings, risk, uh, returns models that have been proven to be able to distinguish the health state of banks? And if not, what is the difficulty in returning back to basics, dumping all these unnecessary complexities and just looking at the simplicity of risk and return as a basis for assessing the health state of a financial institution? Thank you. Your, your question speaks to the typical cycle that occurs in, in any innovation, particularly in a financial innovation. We start with what you call the basics, the underlying collateral, what everybody understands, can touch, can see. Call it company earnings, call it company default rates. And then someone comes along and says, you know, through a bit of financial engineering, I can take all these companies, yeah, okay. I can package them, and then I can sell different tranches of the package that have similar characteristics. And because of that, I make huge efficiency gains because I provide to the investor a much larger menu and I provide to the investor the ability to pick what they like. No different from you being in the kitchen and starting with basic food products and combining them into a dish that people really like. And more people will, will eat that dish than they will eat the individual. And then people say, well, wait a minute. If you can do it that way, why don't I take what you've produced and repackage it again and leverage it again and produce another product? And someone says, yeah, well, once you've produced that product, we can do something else. And as we go down that sequence, we lose sight of the basics that you mentioned. In particular, you no longer worry about the fundamental elements. You worry about how these different instruments will interact. So you go to correlation modeling and not credit modeling. The question would come, is really inflation imminent? Or is it something that might happen and might not happen? And is it going to be an inflation which was experienced some, some decades ago? Or is it going to have a, a different characteristic of inflation where, uh, where there is no sanctuary, maybe? I mean, uh, the inflation we're used to is that people will go to sanctuaries, right? like real estate and gold. What type of inflation should we expect? Thank you. Your question is an excellent one. Um, first, there's no doubt that the US economy is slowing down and slowing down at a must, much faster rate than anybody anticipated. Let me tell you the image of the PIMCO trade flow two weeks ago. And those of you who know PIMCO know that we've had this bearish call on the US economy, and we're wondering, why did it take so long? Why did it take so long? Now it's happening, but even us, are taken aback by how quickly it's happening. So two weeks ago was the measure of non-manufacturing sector in the United States. Call it the service industry, which is critical because it employs so many people. The number flashed on our Bloomberg screens and on, on the CNBC screens. 41. Everybody said it's a mistake. That was the initial reaction, it's a mistake. Then someone shouted out to the person whose job is to look at that, when was the last time we've seen such a big drop? Right. And he said, not in the last 10 years. And, and, and even us who have been sort of forecasting this major slowdown, forecasting that the Fed is gonna have to cut very aggressively, were taken aback by how quickly the service sector is contracting in there. So that naturally raises the question of how can you have inflation, as you said, if 
the economy is slowing down so much. Notice that I said inflation next year and beyond. The reason why I said inflation next year and beyond is that the amount of liquidity that's being pumped into the system right now is huge. And it has a lag in terms of its impact. So ironically, just as the economy, the market heals itself and starts bouncing up, the impact of the liquidity is going to come back and turbocharge the healing process. Secondly, and Alan Greenspan made it very clear in his book, the world has benefited tremendously from a massive productivity shock that has come from the entry of billions and billions of low-cost labor. That is being repriced. Today, if you look at the inflation rate in China, 7.2% with wage rates going up quickly. So the world is no longer going to have this wonderful tailwind of this inflation. Thirdly, how do we explain the fact that oil is above 90, even though the US is looking at a major slowdown? How do we explain where wheat is, where meat is, right? Whatever commodities you look at, right, they are not behaving in the way you would expect them to behave based on the United States. And that is because there's a major consumer elsewhere now who consumes in a less efficient manner, especially when it comes to energy. They need more energy for the unit of, of output than the United States. And that is going to serve as a cost push element over the next few years. So combine these three things, and I think you're looking at inflation. How do you protect against it, which was the last part of your question? You protect against it through a diversified approach. You want certain inflation-linked bonds that give you risk-free from a credit perspective, but inflation protection. You need to look at commodities. And of course, certain parts of real estate, are in, particularly in the rest of the world, are still very inflation sensitive on that. Let me end um, this by a, a, a story that I was told when I joined the financial industry a long time ago. And that answers the question as to why it takes time for all this to be reflected in people's um, thinking. It's the story of a trader in a hot air balloon who's up in the clouds, totally lost. And the trader comes down, sees someone walking on the ground and says, hey, you down there, where am I? And the person walking looks up to the balloon, looks up to the trader, and says, you're in a hot air balloon about 20 feet off the ground. And the trader says in a very dismissive manner, oh, you must be an economist. And the economist, very excited that someone has recognized his or her profession, says, yes, I am, but how do you know? And the, economist, and the trader says, well, you just gave me accurate information that's totally useless. So the economist says, oh, you must be a trader then. And the trader says, yes, I am. How do you know? He goes, it's very simple. You don't know where you are. You don't know how you got here. And you're looking to blame the economist again. <laughs> okay. And I think that this is, the market is starting to, to smell that this inflation is coming back. The steepening of, of, of the US yield curve has been really significant over the last few weeks. Right? And I think that this is going to play out um, over time. And the economists and the traders will somehow come to the same solution on this view. So, don't you think that uh, institutions uh, that withdraw the cash from, from, from the uh, money manager funds have participated in kind of triggering the events for vehicles like the SIPs because of drying out liquidity, even though the assets are known to be of high quality, frequent days of ABSs and financials? So, this is the first question. And the second question, don't you think that the responsibility comes back after all to the central banks who had lowered the interest rate so low to one to two? very low level that has uh, encouraged um, uh, the, the, the rating agencies 
who run as well after fees, not only not only uh, renters uh, to 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 uh, to get loose in their modernization um, and to get always uh, originators and service or marketers like Countrywide as well to uh, to to not be as strict in, in offering uh, 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 loans to uh, to marketers. Um, the, the third point is about insurance. <clears throat> How can we uh, can investors trust uh, insurance when we have uh, like the monoline crisis uh, lately? <clears throat> even though they have uh, they, they have uh, a quite high uh, capital. Okay, on, on the first one, um, you made a critical assumption that we weren't brave enough to make back in August which is that we knew where the money market funds were investing. Time has shown the money market funds themselves didn't know where they were investing. Many companies have had to inject capital into the money market funds in order not to break the buck, quote unquote, in order not to impose a loss on their investors. Citibank, Merrill, didn't know where it was investing in terms of the repercussion. So, the assumption that we knew where our money market instruments were investing, right, and therefore we shouldn't have pulled the money out was not an assumption that was we, ha we were willing to make at the time, nor was it borne out with history, right? So that takes to the second, to the second question, which, which you said, well, maybe there's the central banks that are to blame for what took place. Right? I think that there's no lack of people that you can theoretically blame for what took place. You can blame the central banks for maintaining interest rates for too low, too low for too long. You can blame financial institutions for getting carried away. You can blame an international system, multilateral institutions that are nowhere to be seen when this crisis hits, right? But the reality is that who is to blame is a phenomenon which is that we had a major series of financial innovation which the world was not ready for. And no matter who you look at, they simply were not ready for the activities that were enabled by, the, by, by these innovations. And that's what the catch-up process um, is all about. Your third issue about insurance. No, I'm not talking about insurance via monoliners. I'm talking about portfolio insurance. I'm talking about analyses that show what the vulnerabilities are to different major shocks and then ask the question, does the market provide me with a cheap way, a cost-effective way to insure against that risk? Okay, so this is portfolio insurance as opposed to using a, an external um, bond insurer company. Yes. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, my colleagues at the Kuwait Investment Authority, I would like to thank our guest speaker. And most of all, I would like to thank you for participating in such event. See you. في الختام نحب نشكر الدكتور محمد العريان على المحاضرة المشوقة اللي تقدم فيها في الندوة ونحب نشكر مؤسسة بيمكو الاستثمارية على تعاونها مع الهيئة العامة للاستثمار في تنظيم مثل هذه الندوات ونشكر الحضور على مشاركتهم في الندوة وإن شاء الله الهيئة العامة للاستثمار راح تنظم مثل هذه الندوات في المستقبل.